Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself. You see, death hates, God hates death as much as we do. Yes. Jesus hates the cemetery as much as we do. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha said, Martha the sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Did I not say unto thee that if you would believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. And the church said, Amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. I want to use the thought just for a few minutes this morning. You're familiar with this text of Scripture and everybody knows the story. But I want to use the thought this morning uh, to speak into your heart, into your life. I had to preach it to me before I can preach it to you. And I tell you, sitting at my desk, tapping some of the things that I tap caused me to stir and caused me to shout right there in my office. I want to speak to you this morning about your life. Not your neighbors, not your friends, your uncles, your aunts, your mom, your dad. But I want you to look yourself in the face of oh, the mirror. Yes. And it is you today, I want to say the words to you that Jesus said to those that stood by that day. It's time to remove the stone. I said it is time to remove the stone. Amen. I think it's difficult today for Christian people to fully understand why that God's word calls for us to be perfectly obedient unto him. We live in a society and generation as long as they can get you to church and get you a dollar, they're happy that you're there. They'll speak tenderly to you. They'll speak good to your mentality. They'll give you some self-help and some, some self-positive thinking to make you feel good about living in your sin. But God has called us once we have come to Him and we give our life to Him, God calls for perfect obedience. So why is it that God calls for obedience? It's not because that he's some cruel despot and he takes some great uh, privilege and pride in laying burdens upon his own people and seeing them go through it. It's not because that he goes around picking out different heartaches and troubles because that he's unloving and harsh. It's not that at all. Because if you remember in, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So God's commands are not grievous. Right, yeah. The world tries to make it like that. Oh, you can't go down to that church. They won't let you do this, do that. And they're so, oh, they got all these rules, got all these regular. Only rule that we got here is obey the Lord. Amen. Obey the Lord. Anytime you tack your little things to God, your religious ideas to God, then you make the Word of God to no effect. I'm not into tradition, but I'm into obeying what God has called us to do. God don't command perfect obedience simply for His own pleasure. He don't just find some self-gratifying, self-satisfying within himself when he sees the fruit of our obedience that it produces. Now, he does have obedience when his children obey him, just like a father does when, when his children obeys them. And he sees them blessed and maturing because they took his advice and they're being blessed because dad knew what was best. And when they listened to those things, it saved them a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble. God is an example of, the, of a great father. Because you see, there are blessings that are associated with, with obedience. That's right. Yes. Amen. A lot of people have so much trouble in their life. They go from one problem to another problem. Swinging from one dilemma to another dilemma. I see them on Facebook all the time. And every week it's a different prayer request. Every week it's a different problem. Every week it's a different issue. It seems they can't never get to the place where they say, Thank you, Lord. Things are going good. Praise you, God. For the goodness you've done. They live from dilemma to dilemma to dilemma. And I wonder in my 
myself. Or these people are they're a place of disobedience in their life. Because no matter how bad life is, folks, there ought to be a place somewhere where God is good. Yeah. Amen. When you read the Old Testament under the Old Covenant law, when Israel was obedient to the Lord, the result was good fruit and tangible blessings that God placed upon them. Notice in Exodus chapter 23. He said, you shall serve the Lord your God and, be, and he shall bless your bread and your water. I'll take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, neither be bearing in your land. The number of your days will I fulfill. You see, great fruitfulness was the reward of their obedience in living for God. God said when they obeyed his commands, they would receive tangible uh, material blessings. They'd see an increase in their livestock, in their vineyards, and in their crops. They'd enjoy good weather, provision, personal protection from the Lord. Their obedience would also result in great powerful spiritual blessings, including manifestations of the glory of the Lord. But we know Israel's story. They chafed under God's law and they kicked against the very commandments that would have made them strong and blessed them and made them victorious and prosperous. It was meant for their own benefit that they resented it. Amen. Even in the New Testament, some of the Lord's most devoted followers questioned His direction sometimes in their life. In some cases, it seemed like that they would have been uh, validated in their questions. He tells them in verse number 7, when he hears that Lazarus is sick, he waits around for a while and, and uh, then word comes to him. He tells him, he said, let's go to Judea. Well, his disciples are like, what in the world are you talking about? If you remember the last time we were there, they tried to kill you. And if we go back, I'm sure they'll try again and may succeed this time. But then Jesus tells them, our friend Lazarus is asleep and I'm going that I may wake him. Well, their thought follows human understanding. They thought, well, if he's sick and he's asleep, then he's doing better. It's the best thing for you if you're sick to be able to sleep. If he's asleep, it's good for him. But then Jesus plainly tells them what he was really talking about. He said, Lazarus is dead. And this probably made even less understanding in their mind because if he's dead, then what's the point going and risking our lives to be killed with him? If he's dead, there's nothing you can do for him now anyway. But you see, the Lord gave his followers a clear and a definite direction. We are going to Judea. So, they're confused. They're afraid. They don't understand. And when we do that and we don't understand God's word to us, something that he's telling us to do that puts us out of our comfort zone then we begin to question. We begin to make all kinds of excuses. Why? That we can't obey His Word. And that's what the disciples did. They couldn't make any sense as what Jesus was asking them to do. How many sincere Christians today are going through the same thing when God gives them a direct word, a direction in their life? This is the way that you ought to walk. This is the way that you ought to leave. live. And it don't make sense to them. And they begin to make every excuse in the world. Yeah, but if I do what you're telling me to do, it's going to mess up everything up in my life God speaks to our heart about an act he wants us to obey and we don't understand it we can't make any sense out of it we find every excuse in the world to not obey what God has put in our heart when all along it's the spirit of God speaking to us and it's for our own benefit God's got a blessing that we can't see because we can't understand why he's asking us to do what he's asking us to do. And then comes the time when things become what seems to be impossible. Jesus tells them, he said, we're going to Lazarus. Lazarus is asleep. They said, sleep, let alone. He's doing good. And finally Jesus said, plainly, he's dead. But I'm glad. Notice what Jesus said. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Yeah. Hold up here just a minute. I don't know about you, but just recently coming through uh, the death of a loved one, if I'd have, if, if I'd have uh, been talking to Jesus and I uh, told him that uh, my, my son was dead and Jesus said, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there, I'd be like, what you talking about, white man? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean you're glad that you wasn't there? 
Are you glad that he's dead? Jesus said, I'm glad for your sake. I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. What he was saying is that there is a purpose in my delay. Can I tell you, God ain't never late. Right. God ain't never late. He ain't even a millisecond late. God ain't never late. If it seems like he's delayed, he's delayed for a purpose. And that purpose has got your benefit in mind. I, Jesus said I was delayed because there is a greater purpose for you. And he said it don't have that much to do with Lazarus. But for you, my friend, Amen. it was for your faith. You're going to face the impossible. You don't know the things that's going to lie in the days ahead of you. But you're going to need faith. And you're going to need great faith. I tell you what, I don't just want this Sunday morning once in a while, every other time, every other month when it's convenient for me religion. I want a faith that's going to be able to move mountains. I, I want a faith that is going to be able to shake the corners of hell. I want a faith that is going to open up the blinds and make the dead walk out of the grave. I want great faith today. Jesus said, be obedient unto me, and I'll build your faith today. That's what he's saying. Amen. But you see, they're struggling. They're struggling with their unbelief. They've seen Jesus heal the sick. They've even seen Jesus raise a girl from the dead that had been dead just a few hours. But they ain't never seen him raise somebody up been dead four days. You make all excuses in the world for the miracles of God. Well, she really wasn't dead. She was in a, a como state. Preach it any way you want to, baby, but the Bible says she was dead. Amen. So they're struggling. So when he gets to Bethany, when he gets there, Martha runs to meet him. Mary's sitting still in the house, weeping and crying. People grieve different. Martha comes running out to meet him, and she represents the attitude of many Christians today. We accept that God can perform miracles as long as we can understand and see that it's possible to be done. Oh, yes, I believe God can do it as long as I can make sense of it, and I understand it, and I think he's able to do it. She, she runs out there, and even the disciples doubted. You see, we, ex we accept that God can do miracles as long as we have a sign of hope. What happens to our faith when the Lord brings us to an impossible situation that demands the supernatural miracle working intervention of an almighty God? You see, there was question in, in Martha's mind about the ability of Jesus to be able to do anything for her brother now. He's been dead four days. If he'd been here four days ago, I believe he could have done something. But he's been laying in that tomb four days. She just didn't have the faith. The disciples doubted his power to deliver them from the possibility of being killed, going to Bethany, let alone bringing a dead man out of the grave, been dead for four days. Matter of fact, before you get too down on yourself for not having the faith that you think you ought to have, there wasn't anybody there that day that had the ability that was equipped with the faith in this seemingly impossible situation. Why? Because there was a stone that was blocking their ability to be able to see. There was a stone that was blocking them from being able to receive. There was a stone that was there that was blocking them to be able to see the miracle power of God. But then there came the time to remove the stone. You see, our dilemma comes when the Lord begins to deal with our heart and reveals something in our mind, in our heart, that there's something in our life that needs to go. There's something in our life that needs to go. In my sleep last night, God spoke. And this is what I heard. I mean, it, it was so audible. It woke me up. And he said, there are some if they don't obey me now, yeah. I will leave. Amen. Yeah. I don't know. Jesus. That's just what he said. Amen. And I'm like, oh Lord, is there anything in my life where I need to be obedient now? Amen. You're always going to wrestle with stuff. You're always going to battle stuff in the flesh. 
But maybe there's something in your life that you've been battling that God has been dealing with and He keeps telling you, He keeps reminding you, and the Spirit keeps bringing you to your mind. This needs to go. Yes. The deliverer comes when God deals to our heart and tells us something that needs to go because, see, it is a bondage. It is a bondage that we carry every day. It is a bondage that we carry year after year, never able to enjoy deliverance from His dominion in our life. It sticks to us like grave, grave clothes that is wrapped around us and it's got us bound up in a tomb in our life. Hallelujah to God. But in order to really, and I mean really, walk in perfect obedience with God, we've got to take down the bondage. We've got to roll away the stone. We've got to get it out of our life and then God will set us free to you see our clinging to it is a sign of our lack of faith our clinging to it is a sign that we don't have the faith that we need because we don't trust the Lord's ability to bring the fruit of our life out of the obedience to his word we don't want to get rid of the junk, the garbage, the sin, the unholiness out of our life because we cling to it like a security blanket. Martha said, you've been dead four days. The disciple said, you've been dead four days. They were clinging to the stone. They didn't want to move the stone because once they moved that stone, they were professing they believed what was going to happen next. You hear me today? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I want to hear a thunder later. I want to hear a rumbling of stones being rolled out of the way. I think there's some people's lives that need some stones rolled out of the way. And I tell you, you're going to change your life forever yeah. once you roll that stone out of your yeah. way. Yeah. The things that God, the blessings that God has for you is hid up behind that bondage that you're in. If you can roll that stone away, he'll set you free. He'll bring you out of that grave. He'll take the grave clothes off. Hallelujah to God. I'm telling you, if you'll believe, you'll see the glory of the Lord in this place today. Yeah. See, we don't trust the Lord's ability. What do you mean roll away the stone? If we roll away the stone, that means you're going to try to do something crazy, preacher. If we roll away the stone, that means you're going to do something with this dead man. And we're not sure we believe this. But we must be aware and we must remind ourselves of the fact that God has supplied each and every one of us with all the power and resources that we need to obey his word. Yes the presence of his spirit that dwells in us. A gentleman sent me a text this morning out of the blue. He said, hey, we're praying for your services today. And I said, just shoot up a little extra prayer, if you will. He said something to the effect, he said, that power is within you. Yeah. Amen. I'm like, ain't it? Yeah. Ain't it? I ain't come this far because Larry was a good fellow. I ain't come this far because Larry was perfect. I ain't came this far because Larry was strong. I came this far because what he put in me has pulled me through the heavens and pulled me through the fire, pulls me through the flood. When I give up and feel like I can't make it, his spirit pulls me up to the top. I think it's time to roll away the stone. God has got a resurrection in your life that he's going to bless you today. You got to know that God has put inside of everybody that's a believer. The Spirit of God. Everything we need to obey him. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 8. And he said, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You see, the death and the resurrection of Lazarus was more than just a dead man's body. I think it speaks two things to us in this story today. First of all, Lazarus laying in that tomb wrapped up with all them grave clothes represents the chains and bondages of this life and the stench of death. That's why the Bible said until you're born again, you're dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're wrapped up in bondage, wrapped up in addictions, wrapped up in lifestyles, wrapped up in habits that are not pleasing to the Lord. 
And Lazarus laying in that grave represents the darkness and the hopelessness and the hopeless burial of our freedom that was stolen from us through sin. Paul may have been even possibly thinking about Lazarus when he wrote in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He may have been, even been thinking of Lazarus there. But secondly, in that tomb, when Jesus calls his name, Lazarus, come forth. <clears throat> Lazarus represents the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. A picture of of the glory of God made manifest before all humanity. A person completely set free from the dominion of sin. He represents the resurrection of life and freedom from the death grip of those controlling bondages that we wrestle with in life every day. And for so many today, there is a great stone blocking them from their freedom. There is a great stone blocking them from their deliverance. Blocking them from their blessing. Blocking them from health. Blocking them from healing. And that stone is sin. Yes. We don't like to talk about it in today's church. There's a lot of churches you'll go to today. You could have popped in on Sunday morning. Our Sunday school lesson this morning, uh, Pastor Mark brought out uh, talking about holiness. And as he was teaching, I thought, you know, there's a lot of churches that will avoid the terminology of even saying the word holiness. Because they associate it with the holiness church or the holiness movement or the Pentecostal church. Holiness ain't about Pentecostals. Amen. It's about God. God is a holy God. The angel said he's holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah to God today. I tell you, if you're going to please God, you got to be holy. If you want to be like God, you got to be holy. If you want the blessing of God, you got to be holy. It ain't popular in this generation. But what we try, they work so far. I say, let's go back to the basics. Go back to the beginning and obey the word that God has given us today. Amen. There's a stone of sin at the tomb. You see, Martha protested against Jesus moving the stone. She's like, Lord, you know what he moved? He stinks by now. His body is beginning to decay. And there's a lot of Christian folk. Yeah, Christian folk can be in bondage. Yeah. Some people in bondage don't even know it. They get all religious on Facebook. But then they can't stop their tongue from talking about people. Some people criticize other people because they got problems in their life. But they got problems that's worse than that. That nobody knows about. Amen. But people live with the idea, with the same mentality about their bondages that Mary had. They live with the idea that this thing has attached itself to me for too long. I can't be set free for it, from it. I can't seem to get away from it. It's got too great a hold on me. And I've listened and I've talked to people and, and I've heard them say, Preacher, I try and I try and I try. This thing has just got so much of a hold on me. That was Martha's mentality. Lord, it's too late. Nothing you can do now. This is part of our life. We just got to accept it. But I tell you, no. It's time for you to see another reality. It's time for you to open up your eyes of faith today. I'm telling you, be able to see beyond what Martha could see. Be able to see what the disciples could see. It's time to know that the truth and see the truth that will make you free. To hear a word that will bring you out of the bondage of death. God's revelation to you right now. Laying in a tomb wrapped up in unbelief. It's time that Jesus said it's time to remove the stone. Get that stone out of your life and you'll see the dead man come to life. He said if you'll believe, you'll see the power power of God. Amen. Jesus told his disciples in verse 40 when they were doubting when they couldn't see past the stone Jesus told them did not I say to you that if you would believe you'd see the power of God 
Ain't it funny all of them following him heard that? But he just wasn't clicking with them. Now we can read the story in retrospect. And then I tell the Lord all the time. I think about my younger days and I'm like, Lord, I'd love to go back to when I was whatever, 10 years old, wherever I'm thinking about the time and do this all over again. But with the knowledge I have now. Wouldn't you like to relive life with the knowledge that you have now? I wouldn't have stepped on that nail when I was working on the chicken pen when I was little. I wouldn't have shut my eyes doing about 30 miles there on that motorcycle and drove through a barbed wire fence. I'd have kept one eye open. A lot of things we'd have redone, right? And if I'd been with the disciples and Jesus said, Boys, this is not for you, but for the power of God. If you believe, you'll see the power of God. I've been on my way to Bethany thing. What we're going to see today? Glory to God. We're going to see something. See, they did. They couldn't look back and see it that way. They're just learning, just like you're learning in your circumstance today. What you're going through today, you've never been through before. But God's speaking to you today with just a stone that's blocking your blessing. There's a stone that's blocking your deliverance. There's a stone that's blocking the resurrection of life that you need. There's a holdup. There's a snag. There's a sin. There's a stone that's blocking the glory. Jesus came to that tomb. Lazarus laying inside all wrapped up in grave clothes. Bound up, tied, no hope. No hope inside the grave. No hope outside the grave. And Jesus says, roll away the stone. Yeah. Now he could have commanded a legion of angels to move that stone. Matter of fact, angels are so strong, they held back the, the waters of the Red Sea till the children of Israel got through. Some preacher said that they flapped their wings all night and blowed the waters back. But I do know that angels are so strong, the Bible said they moved the stone in front of the tomb where Jesus laid. He sent angels down to move the stone. So I know angels can move stones, but he didn't call for an angel. He didn't call for an angel. Jesus told those disciples, roll away the stones. He's saying the same word to you and me today. If you want deliverance, if you want to be free, if you want to be loosed, roll away that stone of unbelief. You're not moved it because you don't believe it's possible. But if you roll away the stone, victory's there. He could have called for angels, but he commanded human hands to remove it. And when they moved that stone, it was their act of faith they may not have known it, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't move the stone. They said, he's dead. He'd been dead four days. Now he's dead. They wouldn't move the stone because they didn't believe there was any need in moving the stone. So when they moved the stone, it was an act of faith saying there must be something going to come out of this. They acted on faith, and when they acted on faith, they saw the glory of God. Here comes Lazarus. The Bible said he was wrapped up in grave clothes all the way down to his feet with a napkin around his face. I mean, he couldn't walk. I mean, he's still, he's a mummy. You know, they got uh, these movies. The mummies, they got the legs separated. Here come the mummy, you know. That ain't how they wrapped them up in those days when they died. They put their legs together and wrapped them up. I mean, you could have carried him like a board. But when Jesus said, Lazarus, could you imagine that day? Sometimes when I get down to Mother Grubs, you know, when your face is long, you can eat oats through a half inch gas pipe or weeds through a picket fence, depending on what county you live in. <laughs> Jesus get the word Lazarus is sick. All right. All right, let's just hang around here three more days. Sucker dying a minute here now. So, so finally, when uh, he tells the boys, they said, hey, Lazarus is dead. We're going to Bethany. What in the world are you talking about? They tried to kill him. Let's not get into this confrontation, Jesus. The ministry's going pretty good right now. People get a little mad at you. Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believe you see the power of God? We're going to Bethany. Jesus walks into Bethany, into the town where they tried to kill him last time he was there. Jesus walks in with no event, no confrontation. Jesus walks in. Somebody comes running. Mary Martha's sitting in the house weeping and grieving. Family's there. Everybody brought chicken. You know, Lee's recipe boxes all over the <laughs> living room. Great flowers everywhere. You know, they've been grieving for four days. They're sitting there crying. Somebody says, the master's here. Martha gets up and she runs out to meet him and she falls down and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You don't know the grief until you lost a loved one. And 
She said, I know that he'll live again. He said, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. And he said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he said, do you believe this? You know, I believe that Jesus came to our churches today. He would quote some scripture. He said, do you believe this? So many of our people, when I'm preaching, they're just like, hey, man, hey, man, hey. But when we get out there in the world and we face those impossible situations, they're like, preacher, what are we going to do? You're going to stand on what we preach, what you're going to do. You're going to stand on what we believe is what you're going to do. I'm going to hold on to the only thing that I know that is able to hold me and see me through this today. It's not a time to give up on the Lord when things go bad. It's a time to grab a hole with both hands and hold on to your life today. She said, yeah, I believe he'll... Live again in the final resurrection. We're all going to live. He said, Martha, get up. I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah. Yes. Martha gets up and everybody's weeping. And, and what is it? Verse 35, somewhere there, the shortest verse in the Bible, John 11, 35. The Bible says Jesus wept. You know what? I believe he said at, my, at the graveside of my son and wept with me the other day. Yeah. I believe he weeps. He wept because his friend had died. Jesus knows what it feels like to have grief. The Bible said he, he groaned in his spirit. And I think I felt that groan. He groaned in his spirit because he hates death just as much as you do. Show me where you laid him. Jesus trying to keep his composure. Oh, he got clapped his hand and stomped his feet and the earth would have went black and shook like a, it was having a convulsion and graves would have busted over. But he's holding his composure because he got something he's wanting people to see. He's building a church that is going to have to work by faith. Amen. He couldn't have no little namby pamby tiptoe through the tulip church that was politically correct and afraid of hurting anybody's feelings. He was making men that was going to turn the world upside down. And he had to show them things that would carry them on throughout all their life. Amen. So he, he said, show me where you lady. Dare you. Take him down. The Bible said it was, a, it was a cave and a stone laid in front of it. Jesus stood there and he groaned in his spirit. He's probably got tears in his, down his cheek. And he says, roll away the stone. All right, hold up, preacher. That's all right on Sunday night. We can shout and roll around the floor and do all that. But now this is getting a little crazy. Martha said he'd been dead four days. He's stinking now. He's de decomposing. Jesus said, roll away the stone. They roll away the stone. And notice what Jesus said in his prayer. He said, Lord, I thank you that you hear me. He said, I th you always hear me. But I don't. Say that for my sake, but I say it for everybody that's standing here. They would have been around the hills. They would have been standing in the valley. They'd have been, everybody would have been standing looking at that tomb. Thomas would have been there. I don't know about this. Peter and John would have been there. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? Jesus said, I say this because of all these that are standing beside me, that they may believe that you sent me. And he looked in that tomb and with a loud voice, Jesus cried, Lazarus, come forth. And with those grave clothes wrapped around his body, he couldn't even walk. He had to float out of that grave. There's no way he could have walked on his own. The power of God brought him forth. And he's, as he comes out of there, as he comes out of there, he's coming out. Could you imagine what the disciples saw? Could you imagine what Mary and Martha was thinking? Could you imagine what all that crowd was doing? The Bible said many of them believed after this. Holy God, they all had glory to the Lamb of God. He said, loose him and let him go. You know why? Because all that bondage, all those great clothes, they may have represented death, but once they wrote the stone away, they was alive. Man on the inside. I'm telling you, God is wanting you to move the stone because it's a living, breathing organism inside of you today. Amen. Woo! Come on. Loose him and let him go because he's not dead any longer. Once you roll that stone out of your life, that if loose you, let you go because God's going to resurrect you. 
with this I'm going to close with everything in my being I believe that today when you move that stone of unbelief the resurrection of Jesus Christ will be released inside of you yes. one word from the Lord of all glory and all the cloth and the rags of bondage and death is going to fall from your life. My word today to you in this congregation, YouTube, Facebook, the word to you today is the same as Jesus' word in 2,000 years ago. Remove the stone. Remove the stone and believe and you'll see the power of God. Will you stand with us all over the house?